All right, it's 3.30, my official starting time. So welcome everybody. My name is Brian Rothstein. I'm an internet marketer. I'm from Montreal. I'm in for the weekend. Uh, hopefully by the end of the session, we'll have a better understanding of what's going on with SEO. And, the, and um, uh, I came all this way just to make sure that everybody was you know, up to date with what's going on. Um, before I fully get started though, I'd like to know how many people, show of hands, how many people in this room have, are attending their first WordCamp? Show of hands. Oh, wow, amazing, amazing. All right, and how many people are returning? Wow, so it's like 50-50, that's amazing. Um, well, it's almost the end of the day. I'd like to give a round of applause to the organizers and volunteers, everyone. I mean, it's been really good, really educational. And uh, I think that um, you know, putting on events like this keeps the community strong. And uh, if you're going to tweet at all, try to use hashtag WPLife. It's a community talk. It's based on a community talk I gave last year. And uh, I think that keeping the community as strong is really important, especially with all the big changes in Gutenberg. Um, a lot of changes coming with WordPress. And, uh, um, you know, we all have to help each other with this. So, current trends in SEO for businesses and bloggers. My talk today uh, is about SEO, but I haven't really been talking about it for quite a while. And the reason is, SEO was actually stable for a few years. Uh, there wasn't a lot going on, and when people would call and ask, like, uh, you know, can you provide updated training services, which is a service I offer in Montreal, I'd say, look, you don't really need that much of an update because there's not, there's not that much change going on. Uh, and the last couple of years, all of a sudden, things went from almost a plateau to, like, just taking off. There's been, like, exponential growth in SEO and the way we conceptualize and think about SEO. So I want you to understand that like, this talk is not necessarily tactical. I mean, I do give some tactics, but it's more like conceptual. I want you to understand what's going on, what kind of thinking you should have when you're approaching uh, an SEO plan. So it's kind of like meant as a, an eye opener. Now, uh, is Google thinking about you? Are the rankings thinking about you? Yes, Google is thinking about you. Absolutely. Um, let's face it, the people in Google are geniuses. They've come up with better and better ways to get you the answers that you're looking for for, all, for, the, for your different search queries. But the thing is, more than ever, they want to know how you think, what your habits are, and what you're going to choose, and why. And that why, of course, is always the most difficult question to answer. Why are you choosing what you're choosing? So our story begins with consumer behavior in 2018. Okay. Now, when I mean consumers, I'm not just talking about people buying products, I'm also talking about the people who are consuming your content, whether it's written, audio, video form, what have you. So what, what is consumer behavior like online? Well, we're certainly very inquisitive. Like, I don't know what C is researching, but I can tell you that people are researching more things than ever before. Um, people just want to research things because they can. And that's a big shift in the way the general public um, kind of understand search engines. They're like, and apps and everything involved in the digital world, they're getting that, you know what, I can research something that I never really cared about before. For example, toothbrushes. Now, think about this for a second. Like 10 years ago, how did you buy a toothbrush? You walked into Shoppers Drug Mart and you, you saw that there was like, you know, like soft, medium, hard, and you looked through the different brands and there weren't that many, and you said, okay, I need like, you know, a soft toothbrush and this one's on sale, done. You put it in your basket, you walked out, never thought, never thought twice about it, right? The internet comes along and Google gets better and better and people get more used to actually looking for answers online, and everything changed. So now you want to read about the different toothbrush options online. You're going to read reviews about all these different options. You're going to do like a 360 degree panoramic virtual tour of this toothbrush to be like, what is, what is up with this? Do I really want that one? Um, you're going to watch videos, you know, of people brushing their teeth, you know, like, oh, you know, that's a good technique. I never thought about brushing my teeth that way. Um, you're going to ask Siri, you know, Siri, what's the best, tooth what's the best toothbrush? Um, you're going to read questions that people are, are put on message boards, like, you know, like, what's the best, uh, what are the best tips for, like, toothbrush maintenance? Um, you're going to go on Indiegogo, and you're going to say, oh, is there some new advancement in toothbrush technology that I should be supporting? You know, I can invest in it now and then get it in two years from now. Why not? 
Um, but the bottom line is that um, you know you want to know everything there is to know about this toothbrush, like everything there is to know about this toothbrush. You know that's right. You say it in Batman's voice. You know you're like, whoa, yes, this is the toothbrush of the future. This is the one I research. This is what I want. And the, at the end of the day, you get that toothbrush. And you are looking for information on every little part of your life. And Google is trying to provide you with those answers. Now, they'll give you those answers, and it doesn't even matter where you are. They'll give you those answers on demand. And that's really key. You want that information? Google is ready to provide you with that, with that information. I mean, look at this guy. He couldn't wait to ask Siri for an article on uh, the top 10 signs that you're drowning. I mean, it doesn't matter where you are, what you're doing, you want that information. And you want it quickly, okay? Let's face it, this is absolutely you when you have to wait more than a few seconds for that information, okay? You don't get information quickly, whoo boy, you got problems, all right? Now think about how frustrated you get when you don't get the exact answer you want as quickly as possible. And people are also impatient. Now, um, as businesses and as content providers, as bloggers, um, you want to make it easy to provide information for people. And um, people like, uh, here, I'll give you an example. People are asking more and more about the weather. Why do they ask more about the weather? People are like obsessed about the weather. Uh, I was at my cottage the other day, and my friend was like, um, oh, you know, he's looking at this app where he's tracking the clouds, and he's like, oh, any second now, a cloud's going to go over us. Like, Who's obsessed about the weather like this? You know, pre-internet, pre-apps, nobody really cared that much. All of a sudden, people care. And it's important that you guys understand, people care. Um, and uh, so we're expecting convenience, we're expecting we're impatient, we want that information, we want the level of detail of that information, and we want it now. Um, what we don't want to do is give up where we are. So we've actually seen a decrease, this is one of the big changes going on uh, recently, we see a decrease in geomodifiers. So for example, um, people are not putting in a pizza restaurant, Toronto, Montreal, 90210, what have you. They're just putting in pizza restaurant. So they're giving Google less information and they're expecting more from Google. So you put more in, um, you put less in, expect more out. And this is a big deal. Um, part of it is what I call the SEO entitlement problem because it's all about me. Everything's about me. People mistake privilege for rights and people feel entitled when they're online. So you, whatever, you're, whatever um, you're doing online, you're expecting things. Like the internet like, owes me something. The internet doesn't owe you anything, but that's just how people think. And as content producers, you need to think about this. If you wanna rank high, you need to consider this. Um, so how do we solve this SEO entitlement problem? Think like Google. And I'm going to walk you through different steps of what, Google do, what Google's doing to account for that. One, they've enhanced user, user experience. Um, they try to make their search engine results pages as useful, usable, accessible, findable, and credible as possible. One of the ways they do that, they offer made-to-measure content. They tailor it. They personalize it. They make it so that whoever is searching at whatever time those people are getting exactly what they want. Um, and how does, how does Google uh, uh, decide what to provide? Like at any given time? Intent. It's all about intent. All right? What is somebody really looking for? Whether they're talking to their phones or typing something into, their, uh, into the search engine, what are they looking for? Um, because Google wants to answer that eternal question, is the best place to hide a dead body really the second page of Google search engine results pages? And the truth is, it is. It's a great place to hide a dead body because very few people are actually going to the second page at this point. A few years ago, when I was giving SEO talks, I was saying, don't worry if you're on page four, it's all good. Then it was, don't worry if you're on page three, don't worry if you're on page two, people will still find you. Actually, Google's gotten so good they don't, you don't, like, most people aren't even going to the second page anymore. It doesn't matter. So I'm going to walk you through a few different uh, styles of search engine results pages and explain to you kind of like a, a brief history br bringing you to where we are today. All right, so here's kind of like your standard uh, Google search engine results page. This is what we've, we've come to expect. Um, you know, we've got sponsored results at the top. Just so you know, um, so now it says here Google Ads. It used to be Google AdWords, Google AdSense. They've actually changed that officially. They, Google officially calls it Google Ads at this point, which is what everyone was calling it anyways. Um, you've got your local pack SEO, um, and then you do, you know, your standard organic SEO results. 
All right, so everybody in this room is familiar with this, right? This has been going on for years. Nothing new here. Um, here, I search for uh, Lady Gaga, and you get your old school blended results. You know, some photos, a news story, uh, video. Here's your classic shopping results. Uh, I search for buy a blender, you get some blenders at the top, and so on. All right, this is pretty, pretty standard stuff. Um, but then things changed. Things change a lot in the last few years. Um, so much so that we have to consider what I call the Google SERP conversion point. Again, this isn't an official term, this is just in-house. We tend to come up with a lot of terms to help, help my, so I can help my team uh, and help my clients understand like, what's going on. Um, and so um, what I mean when I'm referring to Google and conversion is actually not this. Some people think it is, it's actually not. Um, although I'm thinking, you know, maybe I should convert to PDF. That could be interesting. Could be an interesting lifestyle choice. Um, but um, the reality is, uh, this is actually a real result, by the way. You can try this, just try this at home. Um, the reality is, I went to Google and I typed in Star Wars, and this is what I got. All right, so part of the screen is cut off, but um, the point is, look at all this variation. Look at this variety. Um, because we've seen exponential growth in Google SERP conversion points. And what do I mean by that? Every time there's like something you can click on, that's a conversion point. So here, if you, you see a top news story, whether you see um, you know, links over here with ratings. And the interesting thing is, with Star Wars in particular, like this side box goes way down. There's so much information, which means if you're doing anything Star Wars related, well, aside from the fact that there's tons of competition, which we can, we can all you know, acknowledge, um, there's so much going on. There's so much. There's so many opportunities for you to actually present content in a way that can appear on this page and become a Google SERP conversion point. So my, my kind of view of this is um, basically it's where intent meets discovery. So the intent is a person searching for information and the discovery is Google allowing for people to discover things that they want um, when they want it and how they want it and where they want it. So that kind of merging is, you know, brings on like the sweet spot. So um, Google's thinking about, you know, what's the intent of the, of the person searching. Uh, you as a content provider, creator, programmer, what have you, you want to make it easy for people to discover it. And you can do that by making it easy for Google to discover your content and then, you know, hopefully uh, reach the sweet spot. Now, you as a publisher really have to consider this um, because if you don't make your presence easily found and you don't make it easy for people to convert from someone who sees your, your link you know, on, on a page like this uh, to someone who actually clicks through to your website, you could have problems. Um, let's see, okay, now, super important. Don't be so sure that the number one position is all you're after. All right, for years, um, I've been doing SEO since 1997, um, over two decades, and you know, the first decade, decade and a half was all about, you want to be number one, if you're not number one, you're losing uh, a lot of traffic and potential sales and so on. Not anymore. I don't, I don't agree with that idea anymore. There's so many more options out there. For example, we've got knowledge panels. So, of course, I'm sure everyone in the room is familiar with knowledge panels. We've seen these over the last few years. So Google says, hey, we're going to take this information. If someone's looking for information on Audis, they're going to, you know, they've, they've aggregated all this info. You want, you want to know about Domino's Pizza? Here's all this info. You want to know about Lady Gaga? Here's all this info. Great. So it's pretty common, right? This is, these are called knowledge panels that are based on the knowledge graph. So what is the knowledge graph? Basically, it's common factual information. So Google said, hey, everybody's providing these great results. We're, we're, we're pulling all these videos and, and websites and so on. It's been great, uh, but let's go a step further because there seems to be a lot of commonalities. A lot of websites seem to talk about the same factual info. Where did this factual info come from? Well, it came from places like Wikipedia. So they said, hey, you know what? Let's just take the information from Wikipedia and stick it right on our search engine results page and people don't even have to click through anymore. And that's exactly what happened. In fact, when all these guys started appearing a few years ago, Wikipedia immediately saw a decrease in click-throughs um, into their site. And it makes sense because really people were just after some basic information and Google was basically diverting people's attention onto their search engine results page instead of pages like Wikipedia. Now, uh, the knowledge graph is also, uh, it's used by Google Assistant frequently, um, and uh, it actually picks up sentiment. To some extent, it picks up sentiment. So, 
Here's a location of Domino's Pizza. It was rated you know, about two and a half stars. So Google kind of has this sense, or at least had this sense of um, what is uh, good and what is bad. So two and a half stars is in the middle and that's it. So it's a bit of sentiment understanding there. So that was kind of like the next level of evolution with where Google went um, in presenting information and understanding what's out there. The thing is, one big criticism is, it doesn't cite its sources. So it's important to understand that not all this, not all this information is necessarily accurate because there's no sources involved there. But generally speaking, it's pretty good. Um, now one problem we see is, the day I searched for Daily Planet reporter Lois Lane. I was very curious to find out all kinds of information about her. So I typed Lois Lane into Google, and what happens? Well, the first thing I got was Wikipedia. Surprise, surprise, of course. Um, gives me Wikipedia information. I'm thinking, okay, this is great. Now, um, I also found that there was some uh, information here that said, oh, supporting character of Superman and Superboy. Well, of course, Lois Lane, super, uh, you know, Superman's uh, girlfriend. Uh, you know, the publisher of the comic books that she comes from, a DC Comics, partnerships, team affiliations, and so on. Now, the interesting thing is, this information was not programmed by anybody. It's Google that figured it out. Google read the page and said, you know what? Somebody out there is probably looking for this information, and it displayed it to make the Google, to make the uh, search engine results page seem more accessible and more user-friendly to people. Now, what's even more interesting to me is, uh, if you want to know Lois Lane's weight, apparently she's 136 pounds. But here's the thing. According to somebody else, she's 175 pounds. So I don't know. But these are actual results. Now I'm confused. Is she 136? Is she 175? If this is information a comic geek needs to know, they need to know. But the bottom line is, the key factor here is, um, there could be mistakes in this information. So it's not 100% it's not accurate. Um, but Google is actively looking to index information that you guys create as content creators, and it wants to uh, provide the most useful information with a great user experience. So as you're creating your pages, consider factors like this, um, because Google is, is likely to, to pick up on it. Um, which brings me to the most important part of this entire talk, um, which is that Google said, you know what? All this common factual information, the knowledge graph is wonderful and all, but we need to really start thinking about things and think about that intent even more. So they created um, their uh, artificial intelligence uh, plan or program called RankBrain. Now, RankBrain is all you're gonna hear about for the next few years. Ar ar arguably, RankBrain is the single most powerful artificial intelligence in the world. And what it is, is basically, it's a plan that looks at all your searches, works with all the, the standard Google algorithms, and takes it a step further, and actually it teaches itself. And so, it's trying to assess searcher intent. When somebody's searching in Google, they want to know exactly what their intent is. Super important. Because back in the day, we saw keywords, and we're like, okay, yeah, everyone's going after keywords, keywords, keywords. All you heard about was keywords. We need Excel spreadsheets of keywords. Clients called, I need keywords. Potential clients called, said, oh, I need to know about keywords, keywords, keywords. All I heard was keywords. Forget it. It's not just about keywords anymore. Um, there's location. Location. So it's the location of the person searching, uh, searching for these particular keywords. What about the needs of the person at the time? What about that person's general behavior? What about the behavior and the people around him? All these factors need to be included, and I'll give you a few examples shortly. But the bottom line is, the result is, different ranking signals apply to the same search queries, even though there are different people, uh, there's somebody next to you could be doing uh, the same search. Now, um, let me, let me drive this home a little further because it's so important. Here are other computers that teach themselves. Now, here's the thing. Um, when you search Google, it's a flat screen. It's a, you know, if you're on, a, if you're on a, a laptop, desktop computer, you see a flat screen, it's all white and a little search box and that's it. And I don't think people truly appreciate what's going on behind the scenes. You know, if I ask my mom, you know, what's Google? She'll say, oh, it's a website. It gets me things. You know, like, wonderful. It's actually a giant database of information. Um, and 
But you see, if Google was in a physical body and walking around answering your questions, you'd probably uh, give it a lot more respect or like really consider or appreciate it on a, a whole different level. But because it's kind of in your computer and it's on the interwebs and whatever, you don't really realize how powerful this thing is. And it really is a big deal. And let me explain to you uh, from, the, from the perspective of data. So I'm gonna take data from Star Trek here. Um, don't worry if you've never seen Star Trek, um, even though you probably should be watching it. I don't know what you're doing with your life. But okay, data from Star Trek Next Generation. Now, so he's actually one of the, the senior people on board, uh, one of the senior officers, and uh, he's an android. So he's basically like, you know, he's a walking rank brain. You can go up to him, talk to him, interact with him, and, and so on. But when other people, let's say humans and aliens living together in this wonderful world of Star Trek, are on board the ship, so they, they live on a, a spaceship called the Enterprise. They could go to the spaceship and say, computer, what is the answer to this question? And ask them whatever question they want. The computer just gives them what, like, what can give them like a hundred different answers for a question. They have, there's no filtering mechanism. So instead, what they do is they go to data and they say, hey, bud, what's going on? I need the answer to such and such a question. And then data will ask the computer, the ship's computer, and say, okay, this is the, this is the, the question that you know, my friend here has. I need you to filter it out and search within these parameters. So data acts as kind of like the filtering me mechanism because data understands the intent of the question, which is super important. So the ship's computer is just like Google giving you factual information, great, but rank brain is more like data where he's, he's really understanding what you want to get out of that. And that's a really important point because uh, it, rank brain is teaching itself and it's, it's growing and thinking about what do people want at any given time and where they are too. So you're not just sitting at home or sitting in your office. It's, you know, you're on the run. You could be on vacation asking something uh, to your phone and trying to get a result. It's trying to account for all of these things. Um, so some of the considerations. Uh, so it's looking at like the newness of the topic, the content itself, um, you know, like uh, user engagement, you know, the click-through rates, uh, dwell time, how long people are actually staying on the page. But even more importantly, they're looking at general user behavior. They're looking at um, prior behavior of users in that location. So again, location-based. Browser history is important. Uh, Gmail history. For those of you who, for those of you who are using Gmail, it's reading all the, it's getting the gist of your emails and what you've clicked on, what kind of topics you're talking about. It's integrating all of that in into uh, its results, and it's looking at current events. And the result is, it's delivering what you want, when you want, how you want it. Super important to understand, like this is completely changing uh, the game of SEO. So a couple of examples. Uh, well, yeah, I'll give you a few examples. So one, somebody goes to Google and searches for tornadoes, and they'll get, let's say, a freshness-based result. So the freshness-based result would be you'd probably get samples of uh, news snippets because there was a tornado nearby recently. So okay, that's great. You're getting what you want, right? You want, you know, tornadoes happened. You want to know what's happening with tornadoes nearby or maybe, in, maybe even in your own town. But what happens if there's no, uh, there haven't been any tornadoes in your town, you type in tornadoes? Well, possible alternatives could be that, you know, Google says, hey, maybe you're interested in the movie Twister. Maybe you're looking for a documentary on tornadoes. Maybe you want a list of shelters for the next time a tornado actually does hit your town. So it's actually accounting for uh, what's going on, what's going on in your life, what's going on in, with, with respect to your location, to what other people are searching for. Um, Similarly, and this is actually maybe more close to home, for those of you who bake and cook at home, suppose you go to Google and you type in pizza ingredients, and you get a list of, of um, articles or results that actually give you pizza ingredients and they show you how to make a pizza. Great. The next night you decide you suck at making pizzas and you want to order a pizza. So you go back to Google and you type in pizza. And what happens? Half the results might be pizza ingredients and half of them might be uh, restaurants that are providing pizza delivery services. Okay, fair enough. Google's trying to figure out, well, are you still looking for ingredients or are you looking to order out at this point? But your neighbor, the person living right next door to you in the apartment next door to you in the house next door to you could do the exact same search on the exact same time and they'll get 100% results of pizza restaurants 
because that person never looked for ingredients for pizzas. That's what I'm talking about here. Rank brain is de deciding um, what is your intent at any given time based on your search. It's, it's a major game changer. Now with respect to actually carrying out your SEO, um, before Rank Brain, I would do, like if somebody came to me and said, I'm a used car dealership, uh, I need to account for different, um, uh, different search terms. So I'd say, fine, we're gonna make a one page that's gonna uh, center around the idea of used cars. Then we're gonna make another page and talk about cheap used cars. Then we're gonna make a third page, we're gonna call it affordable used cars. And believe it or not, um, I could get a client like 10, 15 years ago to rank number one for all three of these terms. Um, and it would work great. They would do really well. Now it's a whole different ballgame. Now, because of Rank Brain, Rank Brain doesn't, you know, is going to look at this. It's going to take one of those pages, throw out the other two, and say, okay, only one of these three, like they're all on the same topic, topic only one of these three pages actually really makes sense. So, it's going to look at like the bigger picture and say, you know what, um, what are, uh, you don't need three pages, you just need one, and the concept of that page needs to be secondhand cars that are low cost. That's it. Your page, your, whatever content you're producing, needs to be talking about that topic, not these specific topics. Now, even, even taking it to the next level, because um, Google's trying to determine searcher intent, you actually might want to consider creating a page for secondhand race cars, for example, which is some, uh, like a certain format of race car, and then talk about that as well. But it would have to be kind of like divergent uh, content, like no, no, nothing uh, duplicating. Because context has become super important. Um, and uh, here, let me talk about context a bit. If I ask somebody in this room to just take off their clothes right now, everyone's going to look at me in a little chuckle and be like, yeah, this guy's crazy. Um, no, I'm not. I'm just, I'm just trying to make a point here. I'm not asking anybody to take their clothes off. But, because you all think it's like, kind of like strange, right? It's because of the context, right? We're at a conference. Who just spontaneously take their clothes off? Nobody. But you go to a new doctor, and you walk into that doctor's office, and the doctor says, take your clothes off. What's the first thing you do? You take your clothes off. Well, you, you knew the doctor for a minute. Doctor says, take your clothes off. You do it. It's all about context, right? That's what she said, jokes. All about context. All right, here's the thing. Social media, huge aspect is all about context. So when this, when this photo came out, and a whole series of photos came out, where there were firefighters standing in, in front of burning buildings, people went crazy. They went nuts, because they're like, what is this? Why aren't they rescuing the people inside? Look at that little kitten in the window. Why aren't they saving that kitten? What's going on here? And people are like, I can't believe firefighters. They suck, they're terrible, oh my God. You know, of course, until your house burns down, then, you know, then it's a whole different ball game. But um, from the perspective of somebody just coming in out of context, they're like, uh, yeah, okay, these guys are kind of jerks. But who here knows what's really going on? Exactly, who said that? Nice one. All right, this is a training photo. They're just proud. These are like um, youngins who are saying, yeah, we're, you know, this is just a training, um, training exercise. But out of context, if you don't know what this is, you f might find this kind of, kind of confusing. Now, the, the, the crazy part is, Google Rank Brain actually understands that this is a training photo. Um, depending on the type of uh, search terms that you look for, it'll actually give you many photos like this because it understands just by reading the photo and the content of the photo what is going on here. This is like ne next, next generation stuff and it's happening now. Um, Let's see, okay, you can't see the top, it's cut off unfortunately, but I actually typed in uh, flights to Vegas. So I did this for Montreal, where I'm from, as I said, uh, and I didn't even type Montreal flights to Vegas, I just put flights to Vegas, and it automatically knew, hey, this guy's in Montreal, and started giving me all of these results. Um, now, so that's already one, one key aspect, but something else is that um, this whole box, this sponsored box, is here giving me like all these um, um, affiliate links or what have you um, for, for uh, flights from Montreal. Now the thing is, one, okay, notice how it picked up my location without, you know, without me typing in Montreal, but two, uh, you have to understand that sponsored results, which is the way that Google makes its money, um, they're pro I'm assuming, I think, that there's, you're going to see more and more of these work their way into the results, fitting into these formats where you think that they're just natural organic results, but um, they're not necessarily those. 
So remember, don't be so sure that the number one position is all you're after. Clearly, there's a lot more opportunity out there to rank well. Um, now, unfortunately, a lot of people think denial is just a river in Egypt. It's not, okay? Denial is a powerful tool, my friends. I have to make that clear. Who hasn't been in a meeting where you're sitting there with a client and the client's looking at you, look at that guy's eyes. He's looking at you and saying like, I don't know about any of this SEO stuff. I'm gonna give you some money and I need to rank number one and I need to increase sales. Come on, everybody who's a business person and, or you know, works with business people, like from an SEO perspective, you're always in that meeting. You've had that meeting a thousand times where people are, the business person is like, I don't care about any of this, just make it happen. This stuff is way over my head, just make it happen. The problem is, with Google Rank Brain, you're gonna have a lot of explaining to do. So my point here is, you need to explain to this guy, um, you don't just have to be number one. There's so many other touch points, uh, Google SERP conversion points that you can access beyond the number one position. For instance, there's the featured snippet. Now, featured snippet, some people call it position zero or the answer box. Um, I actually really like calling it position zero because it's above the classic uh, top 10 results. And here um, I typed in, uh, how do you cook a turkey? And I got these results. Now, a few interesting points here. First of all, in order to appear up here, there's no structured data, which I'll talk about in a few minutes. Uh, there's no schema here. Google decided that this information needs to be presented in this way. Something else, um, if Google doesn't see numbers here, uh, if it thinks that the end user will have a better user experience, they will add numbers. Now think about that. Google Rank Brain is reading the content of the page, determining that someone reading this, this featured snippet is gonna appreciate some numbers over here, and it adds them in. Like, that, that's pretty remarkable. It's reading the page and breaking it down for the end user better than the person who created the page with the intent for somebody to actually uh, read it. Um, so this is, again, this is, this is the future. Um, all right, how do you become the feature snippet? Actually, Google says there's no way to officially, their, their official stance on it is you can't actually manipulate this in any way. Um, unofficially, I say rank on the first page, have the best content that answers the question. That's it, that's what, that's what you can do. All right, now, so these are some examples of schema markup, uh, rich snippets. Um, Okay, so these, I mean, you, you guys have all seen these, star ratings, concert dates, news blocks. So these are actually gonna become more and more common. There's gonna be more and more variations in the search engine results page. It's all, again, it's, it's like exponential growth. And the more that RankBrain understands what's going on, the more it's gonna come up with ways to display information to make it easier and easier for people. Um, this is a company called Proforce. Um, they, they're a job placement agency, it's one of my clients. They got picked up here. Um, uh, we put some code on, the, on their site so that we developed a uh, job board for them. And so here, uh, you can see that their job board with the help of schema got picked up on the uh, search engine results page like right at the top. Uh, so we did this using structured data. So this is schema, this is from schema. So schema is basically um, a certain code that you can put on your page to manipulate the, the search engine results. And what happened was a few years ago, Google and a few other search engines got together and they said, hey, you know what? Um, we need to make it easier for people to understand how to display information. And to do that, uh, we're gonna come up with kind of like a common standard. So that's what schema is. So they broke it down into um, like these areas, but generally speaking, there's actually hundreds of markup, uh, markup types. So there's different ways that you can make your data appear. So uh, like this, like these are just some, some common ways. You know, you see these a lot, but there's just, there's hundreds of ways to do this. Uh, really important here, what we're finding is that websites with rich snippets actually rank higher. So it's up to you to figure out how to break down your information and deliver it to Google, which will in turn deliver it to the end users um, in the, the simplest way and most relevant way. Uh, to do this, so Google has a couple tools. So this is uh, the actual Google page that helps you walk you through it. Uh, there's some tools over here. By the way, I'm gonna post my slides, so don't worry about if, like, if you don't get the exact web address or name of a product or whatever that I'm showing you, don't worry. You can, you can see it after my talk. Uh, voice search. All right, the next big question uh, is, the, 
because voice search is so important, uh, is SEO going to go down? You know, that's what I get that question all the time. Is SEO is not as important anymore? Well, here's the thing. People love talking to their phones. So you have to be able to create content that is actually going to appear uh, in whatever format of voice uh, interaction uh, that uh, people have. There's a ton of competition. Oh, you can't really see it. It says competition for voice search attention. Uh, obviously, there's tons of competition here. Uh, Apple and Siri, Alexa and Amazon, and so on. So all these different products are out there to listen to what you have to say. You put them in your house, uh, and they're listening to you all day long. I mean, I, I think that if it was up to Google, they would just give everybody uh, a Google Home. Like, the thing is, if they just, if they just said, okay, we're going to give out, you know, a few hundred million Google Homes, people would be losing their minds, like, oh, no, no, there's something suspect here. I don't know. I don't want this thing. But instead, what they do is they make deals with banks, and they're like, oh, well, if you open up a new bank account, you get a free Google Home. And you feel like, oh, wow, I deserve that. You know, I, 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 started, I started a new account. Well, I don't, I, when do I get it? You know, like, they want it as fast as possible, right? Um, I mean, to me, the whole thing is kind of sketchy. The, the fact that any device is listening to everything I say at all times, you know, makes me nervous. But that's just me. Um, it's clearly it's working because millions of people, no matter what they're doing, if they're playing their Xbox or whatever, they're talking to their devices and they're very happy with it. Um, so how do you optimize for voice search? First, you, surprise, surprise, you need to rank on the first page, try to become the featured snippet, and um, have the best question that answers uh, an answer that on your site that it comes down to Q&A, and do that better than anybody else. A few general tips for voice search. Um, all right, first of all, uh, I guess the most important tip is, is uh, this part. Use words that people say. So when you're talking uh, versus when you're uh, reading or writing, you're using different words. Like when you're, sorry, when you're writing, you're using different words from when you're talking. So when you're reading that information, uh, it comes across to you very differently. So when you're creating content, you need to consider words that people use when they're talking and somehow integrate that into the content. Um, because people are more likely to uh, ask specific questions to their devices that you might not have uh, thought about if you were just writing the content and not considering that people, need, need, people are going to uh, be asking their devices these questions. Um, all right, use rich snippets. Um, claim your Google My Business page and put information there. That will help Google pick it up. And uh, have a NAP. So NAP is, uh, if you know anything about local SEO, uh, the uh, name, address, phone number is a, a very key aspect. Um, okay, so how do you know what questions to optimize for? Well, believe it or not, Google actually tells you. Like they're telling you right now, on the change in results page, it says, people also ask, right there. So best way to blend fruits, people are asking, how do you blend fruits? How do you make fruit smoothies and so on? They're putting it right there. So if you have, if you terms, it's not going so well, maybe try optimizing for one of these other terms, like it could work out for you or do a better job of your optimization. There are, there are some other tools that are actually really worth well. we'll install called uh, Public. Um, it's actually very amusing. It's a very fun little website to work with. Um, .io and Mo's Explorer. Um, all good tools to try. Um, I typed the SEO into Answer the Public. Middle. Then we got when. And run it. You can 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 run You can run it. You can run it. You can run it. You as someone who's yeah. helping you out. Uh, Google Correlate. This is actually... So if you're publishing that in 